Hi everyone. Okay, so we are kicking off Unit 6. Um, this is the second semester of AP Calculus, and um, this accumulation of change lesson, the math is not very complicated. This lesson by itself um, is a pretty simple lesson, but I want you to understand that this idea of accumulation is really the big idea that's going to carry us through the rest of this course. So if you remember, the first semester was all about derivatives, and derivatives are measures of rates of change, okay? And so we're still looking at how things change over time, but now we're measuring accumulation over time. And that is going to be the kind of big idea concept that ties the rest of this course together. And it, of course, is linked back to all of the stuff that we did with derivatives. I told you derivatives aren't going anywhere anytime soon. Um, so I started you out here with a really easy question. Um, this question should not require any calculus. I think all of you could answer this question right now. Um, if you drive at a constant rate of 50 miles an hour for three hours, how far have you driven? And I think every single one of you can look at that and say, well, I would say 50 times three, and that's 150 miles. And you'd be correct, okay? I mean, that's all the math that really should be involved here. Some of you might get um, complex enough to be able to say, all right, well, if I go 50 miles per hour and I multiply by three hours, then my hours cancel and that's why my final unit is in miles because 50 times three is 150. Um, miles per hour times hours would cancel out the hours and so it'd be 150 miles again. Um, either way, you, you've got the right idea there, okay? That's an accumulation of change. So this is a rate of change, right? This is how long we're allowing that rate of change to occur. And then this is how many miles we will have racked up at the end of those three hours, okay? So that's what we mean by accumulation. So just if I wanted to draw a quick sketch of a graph here, um, and we're gonna have this be a velocity graph. If my velocity is a constant rate, and so this would be my time here, if my velocity is a constant rate of 50 miles an hour, then my velocity would look like this. Okay, and this is assuming this is at 50, right? I'm traveling 50 miles per hour constantly for three hours. We'll say that this is when time is equal to three. So I don't know, maybe this is two, maybe this is one, okay? And so, again, not that you would need to do this to answer this question, but of course the questions are going to get harder than this. If I were to give you this same scenario and ask you that same question, technically what you're doing here when you're doing the 50 times 3 is you are finding this area. You are saying, well, this area here would be 50 times 3. Of course, my scale is way off here. but um, And so that area is equal to 150 because again, it's 50 times three, and that's my accumulated change, okay? And so that idea is important because of course, this very rarely happens, right? Where we have velocity that's just constant. And so what we're gonna be looking at now is what if our velocity goes crazy like this? What if it goes all over the place, okay? And so if this is my velocity graph. And again, I'm making a big deal about this being a velocity graph because it's a rate of change. If I'm looking at a rate of change and I'm able to find this area, okay, this area is going to tell me how much distance I have covered, okay? It's, it's how much accumulation has there been from that rate of change over time. And by the way, down here, my rate of change is negative, right? This is all a negative rate of change, which in terms of velocity would mean that I'm going backwards. So if I was trying to find like how much total distance I've covered, I would find this area and then I would subtract this area because I'm going backwards by that amount and then I'd be going forwards again here. That's getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. Um, we're not quite there yet, but that's what we're gonna be looking at is these areas underneath a graph because those areas represent the accumulation of a rate of change function. Okay, so let's get into some definitions, things like that. Um, I'll leave this here and then I will get rid of my face for you. But um, So accumulated change is the net change in the dependent variable over a period of time. Okay, 
found by measuring the area under the curve of a rate of change graph. So the area under the curve, this is the big idea, is that area under the curve always measures accumulation, which I guess is up here, but... Okay, area under the curve is measuring accumulation. Um, it's net change, so think about like when we were talking velocity and position and all of that. Really what this would give you is a displacement. So remember up here when I said you would have that negative velocity area and you're going backwards, you're subtracting that because not that your distance is negative, but that you're traveling in a negative direction. And so your beginning position versus your ending position would backtrack some. Okay, so let's take a look at this first example. Um, it says the graph below represents the rate at which water is leaking out of a tank. Important to recognize that this represents a rate. So essentially what you're looking at here is a derivative graph, okay? And I'm asking you how much. So I want you to go from rate of change backwards. I want to know if you have a rate of change, how much actual water does that mean have leaked out after nine minutes? Remember what we just talked about. Accumulation is measured by finding the area under the graph. Okay, so what I want to find is basically what is the area of this crazy looking shape here, okay? Um, and there's a few different ways you can do this. You are going to have to remember some of your two-dimensional area functions here. Um, I want to just use this as an opportunity to remind you about trapezoids because trapezoids exist. So I'm going to sort of block this thing off, okay? We'll deal with the circle in just a second. But I'm looking at this whole part right here at the bottom. That is a trapezoid. And the area of a trapezoid, by the way, there's other ways you could do this, but again, I just wanted to be able to remind you about how to find area of trapezoids. Um, it's one half height times base one plus base two. Okay. Um, honestly, what I usually do is add the two bases together and then divide that by two and then multiply by the height, but it doesn't really matter. So, okay, if I'm finding that area, my bases are the two sides that are parallel. So this length right here, um, that's a length of six units, okay? Um, and my length down here, that is a length of nine units. And my height is right here, that's two units. And then I'm multiplying by one half, okay? Well, let's see, the mental math here isn't terrible. One half times two is one, so one times six plus nine, that's gonna be 15. Okay, so this whole bottom area here is 15, and again, that's measuring gallons. So this, this tells me that 15 gallons have leaked out. I still have to do the circle part but that's where I'm at right now. Um, by the way, if you had wanted to, you know, drop a line right here and treat this as a rectangle and a triangle, that is totally fine. Again, I just wanted to use the opportunity to remind you about trapezoids, but you could have done, let's see, this would be six times two, which is 12, and then area of a triangle, this would be three times two, but then dividing by two, so this would be three, and then 12 and three would make your 15. That's fine too. Okay, let's look at your circle. Or I guess technically it's a semicircle. So it's only half. And my area of a semicircle is one half pi r squared. The one half is only because it's half a circle. Um, my radius here is two, right? So I'm gonna say my area equals, whoops, the equal sign inside the a there. Um, one half times pi times two squared. Well, that's a four, and four times one half is two, so that is really equal to two pi. Okay, so this is two pi gallons of water that's leaking out right here. Okay, and so my total combined area, we could have done this back in geometry class, right? My total combined area would be 15 plus 2 pi. And I'm just going to leave it like that. I mean, I could make this a decimal, right? But I'm, I'm totally okay leaving this just as 15 plus 2 pi um, gallons of water. 
after nine minutes. Okay, so that's all there is to this, is that when you're measuring accumulation, you're really just finding an area. And we, of course, are going to get to more complicated ways that we're going to be finding area. But for today, we're really just using geometry. Okay, just a lot of geometry formulas here. So let's try a couple more. Okay, oh, and this one's got some negative accumulation, which is good. So, okay, particles moving along the x-axis a, at a rate modeled by, so once again, this is a rate function, so we're looking at a derivative graph. How far is the particle from its starting position after 10 seconds? So I want to know from 0 to 10, how far did this thing move? Okay, how far did it, what was the difference in its position at 0 versus its position at 10? I want to point out that I can't find what the actual positions are. All I can find is what the change is. I would have to have, I would have to know what the initial position is to be able to find where it actually is located, but I can talk about the change in position. So, okay, we just have to f start finding some areas here. Um, this little triangle here, that's going to be an area of one half base times height. Um, so let's see, I'm trying to figure out how I want to write this so that it makes sense to you, but I'm doing one half times my base, which is two times my height. Now be careful about how your height is labeled here. It's two boxes, but it's counting by five, so that's actually by ten. Okay, and so this whole thing, half of twenty, so this is going to have an area of ten units. Okay. Now, this section down here, this is where that trapezoid formula might come in handy. And you could block it off, you know, here and here, and make two triangles and a rectangle. That's just a lot of, like, separate calculating to do. So I'm going to kind of wall this off. Let's see. And I'm going to use the trapezoid formula. So I'm going to say 1 half times the height. Now, the height of this thing would be... Um, negative 15. I'm going to just put 15 and make my whole answer negative in a second. And then my base goes from, let's see, 2 to 8. So that base is equal to 6. And then this base down here goes from 5 to 7. So that's a 2. Okay, so that's my trapezoid calculation. Um, this is 8, 8 times 1 half is 4, and 4 times 15 is 60. So this whole trapezoid, all of this, that's going to represent a negative 60. Okay. And then I've got a triangle here at the end. Negative, by the way, because it's under the x-axis. So this triangle here has a base of 2 and a height of 10. So actually, this triangle and this triangle match, don't they? So, because this is going to be 1 half times 2 times 10 as well. So this would be a positive 10. Okay, all of that was just me finding areas, right? And so here's what I know about what my particle did. I don't actually know where it started, okay? But I know that for the first 2 seconds, it moved 10 units to the right. And then from 2 seconds to 8 seconds, it moved backwards, okay? All of this is negative rate of change, negative velocity. So I'm moving backwards 60. And then I turned around and started moving to the right 10 again, okay? So how far am I from my, when I look at my starting position versus where am I at 10 seconds? I'm just going to say, well, I move 10 to the right, and then I move 60 to the left, and then I move 10 to the right again. Um, and so I believe that works out to be negative 40. So that's 40 units to the left. Okay. So displacement on the interval from 2 to 8. So now I'm only looking at this section from 2 to 8. And remember, displacement just wants to know overall how much did my position change. Well, that's this right here. Okay, this is my displacement from 2 to 8. Okay, so my displacement would be negative 60. And again, that means 60 units to the left. But for displacement, we would just give a number. 
Okay, one last example to talk through here. So once again, graph at the right shows the rate of change. So what we really have in front of us is a derivative graph of the people of people in a museum over the course of the eight hours that the museum is open. So this is, if you look at the total number of people inside the museum, how fast is it changing? Okay, so for like, for example, the first two hours, it's changing at a rate of four people per hour, specifically increasing by four people per hour um, because this is up in positive territory, right? And so the fact that this thing dips down into the negative doesn't mean that there's suddenly negative people, um, but it means that the rate of change is decreasing, that the number of people in the museum is decreasing after this time, okay? So we know how to read derivative graphs. We've done that before. Um, this question, I mean, I could have asked you this back in unit five. When is the number of people inside the museum at a maximum, okay? So a maximum occurs when our graph switches from increasing to decreasing, right? Um, so if I was to look at the graph of the number of people, which I don't have in front of me, but I want to find when does this occur? And that would be when my graph switches from increasing to decreasing. So if I'm looking at the derivative graph, this is when my derivative would be positive, and this is when my derivative would be negative. And so I'm looking for when does my derivative graph cross from positive to negative. And that happens right here, okay? So at t equals 4 hours, I know I at least have a local maximum, okay? Now that we could, we could do some further analysis and figure out that that's actually the absolute maximum. We'll talk about that another time. Um, we don't really have enough information to go on to do all of that right now. But this is at the very least a local maximum, right? It's a high point because my, my number of people is increasing, 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 and then all of a sudden the number of people starts decreasing. So right here is when I must be at my maximum, okay? Now this next question, when it says how many people, this is the new stuff that we're talking about today. How many people does that mean there must have been in the museum at this time? And remember, that's when I want to say, how do I get from people per hour to just people? That's when I'm going to find an area, okay? So I'm going to find an area of this. This is a trapezoid. So again, I'm going to rely on my trapezoid formula. Just rewriting the formula for you in case you need it. So I would say one half times the height, and the height here is four. And then my bases, this base has a length of two, and this base has a length of four. So two plus four. Okay, so this is two, and then two times six. So I would say 12 people. Okay, now this is important. Um, because it does say assume there are no people in the museum at the time it opens, I can just go with my answer of 12 people. But technically, this 12 people doesn't necessarily give me the number of people. That 12 tells me how much it has changed by. So from this time to this time, I have increased by 12 people. Okay, That's what I really know, that I have increased by 12 people over that course of time. So if this was another situation and I told you that, hey, when time equals zero, I had 50 people already inside the museum, then I could say, well, then it increased by 12 and I would actually have 62 people inside the museum. So that's where this piece of information is important, that we're assuming that we're starting at zero. And so when I increase by 12, that just means that I have 12 people, okay? Okay, so now you are working the closing shift and are in charge of making sure everyone has left the museum at t equals eight hours, how many people are still inside the museum. Okay, so what we know here, here's eight hours, right? We know that as of four hours, we have 12 people, right? So we have 12 people as of four hours. I now have to figure out how many people have left. And that's what this represents, is how many people have left the museum, because that's negative. Um, I'm going to draw a line right here. I probably shouldn't have shaded this all in together. But I'm going to make a trapezoid here and an itty-bitty triangle here. So I'm going to say this is, I'm going to take my 12 people that I know I have as of um, 
t equals 4. And then I'm going to subtract this trapezoid, which would be 1 half. Um, my height is 2. And then my bases here are 1, 2, 3, 4, it looks like. And 1, 2, 3. Okay. And then I'm going to continue to subtract this little baby triangle right here. So that's 1 half times 1 is my base, and then this is 1, 2, 3, 4, okay, for my height. Okay, so let's see how this works out. This is 12 minus 1 half times, that's 1 times 7, so that's 7, and then 1 half times 4 is 2. Okay, so 12 minus 7 minus 2, that's really just 12 minus 9, so I have three people left in the museum people um, at those eight hours, okay? So again, just to recap, what I found out is that from zero to four, the number of people in the museum increased by 12. And I'm, I'm saying that means there were 12 people because we're assuming there was no one inside. And then from, let's see, well, I guess I, yeah. But from four hours to eight hours, I lost nine people total because this has an area of seven and this has an area of two. And so I lost nine people altogether. And so there must still be three people hanging around. So it's really important to understand that just because this graph is in the negative doesn't mean the number of people has turned negative. In fact, that wouldn't really make sense. This just means that my number of people started decreasing, like 12 was my maximum and then it started shrinking after that, okay? So it dropped down to three people by the end of the eight hours, three people that I have to go chase down so I can go home. Okay, hopefully that was helpful for you. Um, we will certainly be practicing this in class. Like I said, this is just a little taste of what's going to be a really big idea as we move through the rest of this unit.